Hello and welcome to my talk on the fine grained complexity of Boolean constraint satisfaction problems. My name is Marvin Kündermann and I'll be presenting joint work with Daniel Marx. To motivate you to watch the full 30 uh, minute virtual talk, I will start with giving two appetizers that hopefully make you interested in watching the full talk. In particular, I will first uh, introduce the problem setting, which is the setting of Boolean constraint satisfaction problems. Here we are given a set of constraints on Boolean variables x1 through xn, and the task is to determine whether there is a satisfying assignment to these variables that sets precisely k of them to 1 and the rest to 0, we call such an assignment uh, a weight k assignment. What kinds of constraints do we consider? Well, we consider the, um, a, a set of a, a finite constraint family F of constraint functions. These are Boolean functions of some bounded rarity R. And we are now allowed to form a constraint by taking some function F from this constraint family and plugging an arbitrary of our Boolean variables into the inputs. A classic example would be the three sort problem where the task is to satisfy uh, a number of clauses simultaneously, where each clause is simply disjunction of three literals. So here, our constraint family would consist of all ternary functions that have a single falsifying assignment. Another quite different problem would be the vertex cover problem. Here you're given some undirected graph G and you want to find a set of nodes that covers all the edges. So this problem we could express um, with a constraint family that includes just the single binary OR function. So what is the fine-grained complexity of these problems? Well, it's easy to see that any such problem we can uh, solve by exhaustive search in a running time of roughly n to the k by simply testing all weight k assignments. On the other hand, problems like vertex cover are well known to be fixed parameter tractable. So in particular, there's an algorithm that solves it um, in a running time with no dependence on k in the exponent of n. So we want to um, classify problems regarding, uh, with regard to their best possible running time. And in fact, we will see that this uh, brute force running time is essentially optimal under some assumption on uh, detecting cliques in uh, hypergraphs. Interestingly, if we just were to disallow a single type of constraint from our constraint family, namely, we disallow clauses that only have negative literals, then we can actually solve this problem faster in time almost n to the two thirds times k, where here omega is the um, matrix multiplication exponent. This running time is essentially optimal under the clique conjecture. So in this talk, we will see a complete classification of all finite constraint families. In particular, during this uh, classification, uh, the following special case will pop up quite naturally. It's a version of the subs of some problem where we have precedence constraints. So how do we obtain this? Consider the constraint family that, con uh, that includes only the binary implication function. This, the corresponding constraint satisfaction problem consists of uh, the f uh, is described as the following problem. We're given some directed graph G and we want to find a closed set consisting of precisely K vertices. Here, a closed set is a set of vertices such that no edge leaves this set. Now it's quite easy to see that if we were to include some vertex in the closed set, then all members of its strongly connected components also have to be included in this closed set. So therefore, by simple preprocessing, we would arrive at the following um, um, equivalent formulation after contracting all strongly connected component components, where we're given a 
deck with uh, weights on the nodes and the task is to now find a closed set in this graph where the total uh, node weight of the set um, sums up to precisely k. And what we see for this problem is uh, much faster than n to the k running time. That is also not far from optimal, so we could improve this square root of k um, dependence on the exponent to, at, uh, to uh, at best the third root of k, unless the Klee conjecture or the exponential time hypothesis fails. And interestingly, here we will use a connection to a number theoretic problem, the Frobenius coin problem, to which we will come later. So let me take a step back and uh, explain a bit more about the motivation for these types of questions. So the general question that we have is uh, to answer this question, when can we beat this brute force running time of essentially n to the k um, for finding some solution of a small size k? And if we can do so, then can we quantify by how much? Such, prob uh, such questions and such uh, corresponding classifications of constraint, satisf uh, constraint satisfaction problems have a long history. For example, if we drop the size restriction and simply ask for existence of a satisfying assignment or not, um, uh, the constraint satisfaction problems on Boolean or even any constant size domain have been classified into either a polynomial time solvable or NP hard. Also, various optimization variants have been classified in terms of their approximability. Um, and really precisely for our problem setting, uh, this qualitative question of whether a problem is fixed parameter tractable or W1 hard has been studied in previous work by Daniel Marx. This is kind of the coarse-grained predecessor of our work, which answers this question, when, is, when do we need to have uh, some dependence on k in the exponent? Um, of n. And now what we want to do is to try to give precise bounds on these dependence. Other settings that have been studied are uh, the question of colonization algorithms uh, and other settings. So let's go on and uh, classify our constraint families. In order to describe which um, constraint satisfaction problems have which complexity, we will use the following notion. We say that a constraint family f represents some, let's say, gadget function g, if the following is true. We can take some function f from our constraint family and then plug in variable arguments of our gadget function g to really represent this function g. So in particular, we can partition the arguments of my constraint function f into sets, one for each argument of g and uh, two sets for the constant zeros and ones. And then if we uh, set the values accordingly, uh, then we have to, uh, get g, um, we can represent g. So let me give an example for a binary NAND representing um, constraint family f. Such a family would contain some function f with, uh, with the following type of situation. So here we could find uh, two columns that represent the first argument of the binary NAND, another column uh, representing the second uh, argument of the binary NAND, and the other columns are simply constant zeros or, or ones. And now if you see, the only way to set this um, uh, this function to uh, uh, zero is if both uh, both arguments to the binary NAND function would be set to one. So this uh, corresponds precisely to the binary NAND function. This means that we can simulate an arbitrary NAND constraint f f on any pair uh, of Boolean variables xi and xj. And so now what we will show is that the complexity of a constraint function family f is precisely determined by the following three questions. Does f represent the ternary NAND? Does it represent the binary NAND? 
and um, does it represent the binary implication function? So here I give an overview over the complexity landscape. So this is the space of all finite constraint families F. And now um, we can see that uh, all of these problems can be solved in time n to the k. So let us now divide the uh, landscape into two parts, one for families representing the ternary end and the other for those that do not represent the ternary end. We say they avoid NAN3. So what we will show is that this n to the k running time is essentially best possible under the three uniform hyperclick assumption, which we will get to in a second. And for the other case, we show this algorithmic converse that's even more interesting, that uh, shows that all function uh, families that avoid this ternary end actually can be solved faster. And we do this by a reduction to clique. So let me start with the first result. It's based on uh, a hypothesis on the following problem, the three uniform hyperclick problem. We're given a three uniform hypergraph G. This means that every edge connects precisely three vertices. And the task is to determine whether there's a K hyperclick C in G. So a K hyperclick is a set of K vertices such that any subset of three variables of this clique indeed forms an edge in G. And it has been conjectured that there's no mm, polynomially faster than brute force algorithm for this problem. So to reduce this problem into our constraint satisfaction problems that represent the ternary NAND, we first do the following observation. There's uh, it is equivalent um, to solve uh, to solve the hyperclick problem to finding a k independent set in the complement hypergraph G bar. So now let us uh, have every boolean variable x i encode whether or not I include the ith vertex in G in, into my hyperclick C. And now what I have to ensure is that any non-edge, any edge in the complement hypergraph, um, so some set vi, vj, vk, uh, are not all included in my hyperclick C. So we can express this precisely by a ternary NAND constraint that I do not set all of xi, xj, and xk to 1. So intuitively, this is possible since the constraint family F represents the ternary NAND function. There's some technical issue of how to generate the constants 0 and 1 so that I need to simulate the NAND constraints, but I won't go into detail here. These are uh, technical constructions that we do. So with this, we obtain that the brute force running time of essentially n to the k is um, best possible under the three uniform hyperclick assumption. The kind of algorithmic converse to this result is maybe more interesting. If the constraint function f, family f, avoids the ternary NAND constraint, then there is a faster than n to the k algorithm, namely a, uh, an algorithm that runs in the clique running time of n to the omega thirds times k. To show this result, we will leverage the following intuitive fact. If we only had RT2 constraints, then we could reduce the corresponding constraint satisfaction problem to the problem of finding a clique. I will only give the high level argument here. So we first split our variables into k parts in a special way. Namely, we are promised that we need to pick from any part precisely one variable into our solution. This can be done using color coding. And then we observe that each constraint now only touches at most two parts. So if we know the corresponding choices for the two parts, then we can determine whether or not a constraint is satisfied or not. So we can incorporate this information into the edges 
of a graph. So to leverage this fact, we use the following kind of win-win argument. Let us first consider a simple setting where we are trying to find the following um, weight three satisfying assignment. The idea is to guess up to two one variables and then to, um, if possible, identify a violated constraint. So assuming that we have guessed xi and xj as being set to one correctly, then such a constraint that is falsified gives us some information. Namely, in order to set this constraint to true, we need to repair it by setting one of the involved variables from zero to one. Since such a constraint is of bounded error tr, so it can be viewed as a constant, essentially we only need to uh, check a bounded number of n square, uh, a small amount of n squared possibilities for guessing the two, uh, the first two one variables to fix three variables in total. So if we could always do this, then we would get an algorithm that runs in n to the two thirds times k running time, which is f actually faster than what we want to achieve, uh, a running time of n to the omega third times k. So this would be a very helpful, very good case. So now let's assume that this case does not hold. And we formalize this by saying that it only remains to find a robust satisfying assignment. So what is a robust satisfying assignment? It's an assignment where all the weight two sub-assignments are satisfying. So if I take any two one variables from my satisfying assignment and only set those to one, then I would get a satisfying assignment as well. We define a new formula that I, we call phi2. It only includes binary NAND constraints. Namely, it includes the binary NAND constraint on xi and xj if and only if setting uh, the, the weight two assignment that sets only xi and xj to one violates um, uh, does not uh, violates the original formula. So it's easy to see by definition the robust assignments indeed satisfy the new formula phi two. Simply, this is the way that we defined a uh, robust assignment. On the other hand, the more interesting direction now is that if we uh, have an assignment that satisfies phi two, then it also satisfies the original formula, formula. And this crucially exploits that our constraint family F avoids the ternary NAND constraint. So intuitively, this holds since if all my weight two sub-assignments um, are satisfying, but uh, if I take in, include an additional assignment into the um, in, into the assignment, I, I would violate the formula. Then I could use the corresponding constraint to obtain uh, the ternary NAND, so to represent this ternary NAND. So now I've defined a uh, formula phi2, which we can use to solve uh, the instance. And since phi2 is an RT2 formula, it only includes uh, binary NAND constraints, we can reduce this problem to click finding by the above intuitive effect. So this concludes the high level overview over this reduction to click for ternary NAND avoiding constraint families. So now we have seen this kind of tight dividing line. Actually, all of these arguments generalize um, to, our, to the following kind of layering. We can really say that the complexity of some um, NAND representing constraint family is, is tightly um, described by a corresponding uniform hyperclick problem where really the arity of my hyper edges 
um, corresponds to the largest arity of the NAND constraints that I can express. So what now remains is to classify this uh, bottom layer of constraint families that avoid the binary NAND constraint. And as I've hinted at earlier, this um, decision now only depends on uh, the following question. Does the constraint family um, avoid the binary implication or does it represent the binary implication function? For the first case, uh, Dimax in his previous work gave um, already a fixed parameter tractable algorithm. And the more interesting regime now for us uh, is the case where um, the constraint family does represent the binary implication function. So let us start with the hardness result for these constraint families. We consider the simplest uh, constraint satisfaction problem in this regime, which is the problem that I mentioned earlier, the variant of uh, subset sum with precedence constraints, the weighted DAG implications problem. So to recall, we are given a DAG with uh, note, uh, note weights, and the task is to find a closed set of total weight K. We can show hardness from clique as follows. Assume we are given some graph G in which we want to find the K clique. Then we construct the following uh, weighted DAG implications instance. We will have two types of nodes, edge nodes and vertex nodes. And so I will connect the edge node node um, for an edge in the original graph to the corresponding vertex nodes of its endpoints. I will make all the edge nodes have a weight of one and I will make the vertex nodes have a larger weight of uh, uh, a large constant k. So now it's quite intuitive that we have uh, the following fact. If we set our target weight to be k times the large cost of uh, the large weight of a vertex node plus the number of edges that a k clique should have ideally, then such a solution exists in this um, weighted deck implications instance if and only if the original graph G has a k clique. Since our target weight um, is blown up by our construction from k to k cubed, we only get a third root of k lower bound um, under the assumption that k clique has no n to the little o of k time algorithm. Now we show that this um, lower bound is actually not far from the truth. To this end, consider the following structure. We group vertices in order so that in, in into uh, weight classes where a weightx in each weight class ha has uh, the same weight of W2. We will also have all edges be directed from left to right. So this is um, the edges will respect this layering. But let's first consider the case without any edges. So this is really um, the subset sum problem since uh, now we are given this target weight K and we can view every vertex as an item of a certain weight. And now we want to determine a subset of these items that sum up precisely to K. So this problem has classic solutions and uh, ex very fast algorithms running in time is um, essentially n plus k plus uh, times logarithmic factors. But actually we will now describe a less efficient algorithm. But uh, that however will be easier to generalize to the setting with edges. So in this alternative approach, we will use the connection to the Frobenius coin problem, which is the following problem. We're given 
some coin dominations um, with uh, say greatest common divisor equal to one and then the uh, then we know that any sufficiently large number could be represented using these this coin system but the question is um, uh, how large uh, must such a uh, number be so that we are always guaranteed this fact. And Schur's bound for this problem essentially says uh, that any number that is uh, at least uh, the largest coin denomination squared is indeed representable with these coins. So now we will make use of this fact. So first we observe that a solution of weight k can exist only if uh, the greatest common divisor of all weights uh, indeed divides k. Otherwise, it's easy to see that we cannot do this. And now, Schuss bound actually gives a converse in certain situations. Namely, since now I view um, the vertices in a weight class as the coins of a certain uh, denomination, if I could assume that I have sufficiently many coins in each weight class, and additionally I know that the target weight is at least the maximum weight squared, then um, I could, uh, uh, if, if I have this, then I know that I have a solution of weight k. This gives rise to a simple n to the order of square root k algorithm. One simply guesses the items of a uh, weight at least square root of k and then boot forces all the weight classes that have too few coins and with this we can actually ensure these two properties and we are done. So we now um, generalize this result to the setting with edges. So how do we generalize this criterion? The most important notion here is we define this uh, value w of v as the total weight of all descendants of v in the DAG. And now if we have some guarantee, namely that all of these w v values for all vertices v is at most in the order of uh, square root of k, precisely square root of k halves. And if we could say that all weight classes have a sufficiently large number of vertices, um, a number of k vertices suffices, then we really get this very simple condition that a solution of weight k exists if and only if the greatest common divisor of all the weights divides k. And much like for the case before, we now get an n to the square root of k algorithm as follows. We guess all of these vert all vertices in our solution where wv is, a, is strictly larger than uh, square root of k half. Any solution can contain at most square root of k many, so this accounts for a running term of n to the o of square root of k. Additionally, we guess all vertices in our solution that come from a small weight class. This can be intuitively done in an uh, FPT time. And then it remains to do this uh, simple decision um, uh, using this number theoretic criterion. So this shows how we can solve the um, weighted deck implications problem in a running time of n to the order of square root of k. Actually, we now would need to uh, show that in fact, if the constraint families avoid the binary NAND function, then we can always uh, uh, solve it in time and to the square root of k via reduction to the weighted deck implications problem. This is also an interesting reduction, but I will skip this uh, in the interest of time. So we arrive at the following situation. Our classification is as follows. We obtain essentially four regimes. A brute force regime for all those functions that represent 
the ternary NAND gadget or higher. Then a click regime for those that only represent the binary NAND constraints. An FPT regime if the constraint family avoids both binary NAND and application. And then this technically quite interesting implications regime with a subpolynomial dependence on k in the exponent of n. So the open problems, um, the, the most pressing open problem is of course to close the gap for the weighted deck implications problem. Uh, is the lower bound or the upper bound um, the true answer? If we could resolve this question, then actually we resolve this question uh, for the whole regime. Then it would be interesting to um, see whether we can generalize this uh, classification beyond the Boolean domain to larger constant size domain. Also interesting variants of our questions would be to change the target to uh, finding a solution of at least weight k or a weight of at most k. And also there are many optimization variants that might be interesting to look at. Thank you very much for your attention.